Hi, my name is Mark, and you're about to watch a message that was preached at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, we exist to help people take their next step with God. And today, it is our prayer that this message does just that. How's everybody doing this fine morning? It's great to see you. So my five-year-old son it was getting on my case the other day. He says I've been working too much because uh, I've been at the property uh, if some of you know, we have this thing that we're building. And uh, so, I, you know, I'm there so much. I actually, when I go to bed at night, I actually dream about the building, which is actually an improvement because pre a few months ago, I was just having nightmares about the building. So now they're dreams. So that's at least good. Well, anyway, he's been getting on my case because um, he says, I've been working too much. And so I was getting ready to leave for the office. Uh, this is about a week ago. And he says, Dad, you're going to work again? And he says, you know, when are we going to spend some time together? And I'm like, buddy, and so this was on Friday, uh, not this Friday, Friday before last. And I'm like, so I come to him, I'm like, listen, buddy, I know you've been saying I've been working too much. I want to make it up to you. How about Saturday, just you and me, the whole day? All right, how's that? And uh, he says, can I just have 20 bucks instead? <laughs> and I'm like, no. So... I said, we're going to spend the whole day together. You're the one who's always saying, like, oh, you know, when are we going to go out? Just the boys. And so I'm telling you that we can go out, you know, all day. And he's like, well, can I have 20 bucks just for spending the day with you? I'm like, no. Uh, you know, what is your deal? So anyway, um, so then that was Friday. We spend the day on Saturday. Sunday, we all go to church. Monday morning, I'm getting ready to leave for the office. And he says to me, he pulls out this book, you know, this like really easy book to read. And he says, Dad, if I read this book, can I make some money? And I said, now, you got to understand one of the, the ways that it works at our house is I pay my kids to read um, because, by the way, best investment I've ever made. Um, you know, my, my kids, uh, the two oldest, started reading at three. And so I vote whatever like the next level up for them was – you know, I would always say, hey, I'll give you 50 cents or whatever if you read this book. And so he gives me this book that's like level two. You know, it's like five words, a page, and a picture. And I'm like, I'm paying you for that. And he said, but I already read it. And I'm like, good for you. Knowledge is power. But, uh, you know, I ain't paying you for it. And uh, so then he goes into his sister's room and pulls out like a third or fourth grade book that's about 70 pages long. No words, solid text. And he says, what if I read this book? And I'm like, well, now we're talking. And I'm like, you read that book, I'll pay you a dollar per chapter. It was eight chapters in the book. But I thought, I mean, it's solid text. And I'm like, no way he's going to read that. So he's like, all right, cool. So, and the thing you got to understand about my son, and I didn't really think about this too much. My son is a bit of an overachiever. Um, you know, he's five and he's, he skipped kindergarten uh, and he's, he's finishing first grade right now. So he uh, takes after his mom mostly. Um, but anyway, so anyway, so he gets the book. I leave for the office, and I um, tell Carrie, this is what he says he's going to do. He's going to read this book. I've told him it's all our chapter, whatever. He's like, uh, you know, maybe we should talk about these wages that you set. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I overshot that a little. And anyway, so, but nonetheless, I get a call from him. I thought it was my wife. Her phone, call, I get a call from her. I pick up the phone, hello, and it's my son, Xander. And he's like, Dad, what's up, Zan? He's like, I finished the book. Okay, that's good. He's like, when can I expect my $8 payment? I'm like, what are you, an IRS agent? And uh, I'm like, you're five. Stop talking in a way that freaks me out. And, uh, and I'm like, put your mom on the phone. So I put Carrie on the phone. And I'm like, Carrie, did you read the book? Yes, he, Bobby read the whole book. I'm like, tell him to explain the story. Because it's one thing, you know, like I have friends. They're like, oh, I'm a speed reader. Look, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you're basically a speed page turner. Because you have to actually have comprehension to have read. Anyway, they don't know that. So nonetheless, I, uh, I tell, him, tell him to explain the book to you. She's like, Carrie, I mean, uh, Bob, he really, he understood the whole book. So I, I put him back on the phone. Uh, I get him, like, um, when I get home, I'll give you the eight bucks. He's like, all right, thanks, Dad. I'm like, hey, can I, can I ask you a question? Why do you need this money? And he says, well, remember on Saturday when we went out and uh, we, went, we went to Toys R Us? And I said, yeah. And he said, I saw this game at Toys R Us that I know Mia and Olivia would love. And so I want to buy it for them. And I'm like, oh, dude. 
And I'm like, so this whole time you've been trying to earn money so you can spend it on your sisters? And I've been busting your chops? I'm sorry, buddy. And he's like, oh, it's okay, Dad. Hey, by the way, what does bust your chops mean? <laughs> it's, um, it means I'm a good dad. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dad. Thanks for busting my chops. Bye. You know, and uh, now here's the thing, right? I'm, like, I'm listening to this, and I'm like, this kid is five years old and like perfectly understands the definition of the word kindness. And that it, 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 kindness has become this vanilla word in our culture. And it's kind of become the word that you use when you don't know. Well, tell me about this person. What are they like? And you're like, well, they're, um, they're kind. They're kind of what? What kind are they? You know what I mean? It's like, but we don't really understand kind, but we just, kind is, is uh, kind has been equated in our culture. It's become the, like a synonym for like polite. Oh, they're, you know, and, and that becomes the, uh, the oh, do you want to pass the kindness test? Okay. Um, are you nice? Yes. Do you say please and thank you? Yes. Do you recycle? Yes. Okay. Then you're kind. You know what I mean? And that's what it's become. But what, once again, the Bible, um, when it uses the word kind, it's a much deeper word. It's a much more robust word. Um, the, the text that we're going to look at today, we'll see it up on the screen. It says love suffers long, which is a great word for patience, uh, that love is patient and is kind. And according to the Bible, kindness is an indispensable quality that we need. And so as we get going, what I want to do for us to really get the most that we can out of this message, um, I want to start by defining biblically what the Bible is talking about when it means uh, that, that, that love is kind. What does that mean? And so the first is this, if you're a note taker, and that is that kindness is love in action. It's love in action. A, a, a literal translation of that verse that we just read, that love suffers long and is kind, it could literally be translated that love acts benevolently. All right, that there's, the, and we understand that the idea of benevolence is doing something. Uh, it is a physical act of love. It is doing something action oriented, and that's the whole idea: is that kindness has action built into it, and it's once again doing acts of kindness that express love. Uh, at, the, at the root of this Greek word, it has the idea in usefulness. So they aren't necessarily random acts of kindness. They are intentional acts of kindness. Because once again, when it comes to love, talk alone doesn't cut it. And so uh, I love what Jeremiah says, um, and it's one of the characteristics of who God is. It says, but let the one who boasts, boast about this, that they have understanding and know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. So kindness is love in action. Once again, number two, kindness speaks words of life. So while I said that it's not just words alone, we can't say that words don't matter. But it's actually the right word that matters that expresses kindness. Here's what I mean by that. Um, uh, kindness has this ability to pick the right word at the right time uh, to show love. And so in, in Proverbs 26, as the Bible is speaking of this ideal woman, the Proverbs 31 woman, here's what it says about her. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. It's the law of kindness. And so kindness is about finding the right word that'll bring about the right outcome. But notice it says this, that it's the law of kindness. That word in the Hebrew is the word Torah, Torah, which means uh, the first five books of the Bible, uh, talking about the, the, this idea that the, the law of kindness, the Torah of kindness, is that I would actually be able to use um, this passage of the Bible and speak that into someone's life, and that the act of kindness can just change the trajectory of their lives. That's why the Bible says this in Proverbs 21. It says that the words of the godly encourage many, but fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. And the reality is this, is that we live in a world that is depleted of encouragement. Uh, and, and most of what we see on, on TV or, or, or whatever, radio, um, is, is just, you know, or, or online, is just mostly sarcasm. And, and what happens is, or stuff that's going to discourage us, and, and what takes place is, is that whether you realize it or not, we naturally gravitate towards people who encourage us. Because all of us want to be encouraged. All of us want to believe that things are going to be better tomorrow than they were today. And so all of us want to be around people who believe in us, that, it, that, we, that whatever it is, whatever challenge that we're taking on, that there are people around us who believe that it's possible. And so 
Kindness speaks words of life. And then number three, kindness is a mark of spiritual maturity. The Bible says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, the hallmark of a person who is led by the Spirit of God isn't necessarily knowledge per se. It's these nine characteristics, one of them being kindness. And and, and let me just say, once again, because we have this... um, this idea culturally that kindness is uh, kind of like equated, oh, he's kind, but, you know, that means he's weak or something. Uh, not so. Kindness doesn't mean that you're a pushover. Kindness means that you can have a differing position, and you're able to stand your ground and defend your position. You just have an ability to say it in a way that isn't demeaning and that isn't rude. Uh, If you're a parent, you recognize this. You recognize that sometimes saying no to your kids is the kindest thing you can do. And when you you care about someone, sometimes the kindest thing is actually telling them that the thing they want is not the thing that they can have. Because the reality is this. Every single one of us, to varying degrees, want to be influential. Uh, We want to influence our kids. If you have kids, we want to influence our spouse if we're married. We want to influence our friends, our coworkers, whatever sphere of 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 you know of influence we have. We want to uh, to to influence people. To we want to be able to use to speak into people's lives, to share from our experience, share the wisdom that we have, and then as we share that, for that to actually help them. Right? Everybody desires that. But the challenge is this: that doesn't happen without kindness. Because no one will receive anything that's said from someone who's a jerk. And now, because the reality is, if we started on one side of the room and went all the way across the room, everyone who has been able to achieve whatever goal, dream, desire, aspiration that they have in life, here's how it begins. Well, so how did it happen? Well, things weren't going well. But then in the fourth grade, there was this teacher who took an interest in me and was kind to me. And then that's what changed the game. Well, see, I didn't know that I was going to be good at this, but then there was this coach, and the coach took interest in me and was kind to me, and that's what changed the game. And once again, have you noticed that nobody's story ever is, uh, you know, things weren't going well, and then I met this guy who was a total jerk. And I don't know what it was, but every time he berated me, I knew I could get better. Like, why is the story never that? It never, it's never that. It's never that, it it, it can be, hey man, the guy was tough or whatever, but it's always, you know, there was a a level of kindness that caused the person to be influential in our lives. Why? Because that's just the way it works. Now here's what I think can happen, especially on a day like today, is that, you know, the guys can be listening to you like, wow, I came to church and you're talking about being kind, for real? Like, you know, because I stayed up till two in the morning watching these two guys beat the living daylights out of each other. And, uh, and, and so now I'm, I'm listening to, you know, we're talking about kindness. Are we going to like weave baskets or something here at the end? Um, and, and so what I, what I want to do is actually show you, um, but once again, as we go, if we talk about, do we, uh, you know, every guy wants to be influential. He wants to be influential in his home. He wants to be influential in his workplace. He wants to be influential in his world. It begins with people believing that you care about them. And that starts at, a pla- at the place of kindness. Now, um, so I want to take you to, to kind of give you the picture of this. I want to take you to what I believe are one of the manliest men in the Bible, King David. King David was the king of Israel. This guy was an accomplished musician. And it's like, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm the king, which means I'm a great leader, all right, for the most part. And then I'm an accomplished musician. He's also, uh, I mean, like the warrior that people sang songs about. This is the guy that killed a nine-foot giant, and he was 17 years old. Um, But, you know, there were songs written about David that said that Saul has slain thousands, but David tens of thousands. Saul was the king at that time. We're like, David's like ten times as as more, uh, as, you know, uh, as cunning a warrior as, as the king is. And so, but David was a guy who went out of his way to express kindness. And there was a particular reason for that, which we'll get to later on in our message. So I'm going to invite you to open with me to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 9, which is where we're going to be today. And uh, those of you that are, you've been around Calvary for a while, uh, I've never taught this passage before, if you can believe that. Um, and by the way, some people are like, wow, you've never, you never taught it? And that doesn't mean I've never, I've never read it. It's like... 
It's not like, whoa, I had no idea that happened. So I've, I've read it many times. I've just never taught on it. So just because people get confused about things like that. Read it many times, teaching it now. Technically, I've already taught it an hour ago, but I'm going to teach it to you now for the first time. So, but I want to show you what kindness can do. What kindness can do in the life of another person. What, kind, what this expression of kindness can do in relationships. And what we're going to see is this. What kindness shows us about David. And what, what the expression of kindness can show about you, especially when you uh, are kind to someone who's hurt you in the past. All right? So we're going to start. It's 2 Samuel 9 and verse 1. Here's what we read. It says, And now David said, Is there still anyone who is left in the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And so when they had called him to David... The king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And the king said, Is there still not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. And so the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, uh, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. And so the king sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, here's the first thing I want to share with you about the kindness of David. And once again, the love of another kind that we want to have in our lives as well. But the first is this, and that is that we want to be, I, I need to be aware of the needs. All right, I need to be aware of the needs of the people around me. Now, let me set this up by explaining what would happen um, if you were living in the ancient world and you became king. When you became king, your first order of business after they crowned you king was to kill everyone in the family of the person who had been king before you. That's the first order of business. Because the last thing that you wanted was to have someone who was the son of the previous king, the grandson of the previous king, a relative of the previous king who could actually challenge your right to the throne. And so what you would do is, is that in a very brutal way, you would murder all of them and once again, it would just show how serious you were about your kingdom and that nobody was going to mess with it. You'll see this later on in the, in the history of Israel. You get a king who's this evil king rises up, takes the throne, and then he wipes out everyone that the previous king was related to. So uh, David says, is there anyone in the house of, uh, that's related to Jonathan that I can show kindness to in the house of Saul? Uh, Jonathan was the son of of King Saul. And, and so John, that would have made Jonathan the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And so, however, Jonathan believed that David was the one called by God to be king. And so he supported David. And he says, listen, I know that some might think this mine. I'm not interested in the throne. I really believe that David, who turned out was, he and David were best friends. Um, he supported David without any jealousy or envy. In fact, uh, put this in your notes. It says, and then uh, in 1 Samuel 18, it says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Well, there comes a moment where Jonathan and Saul are fighting a battle against this group of people called the Philistines. And they die on the same hill. Um, and then when Saul dies, the people then say, Well, David, we want you to be king. And so David assumes the throne. So the shrewd thing for David to do is to hunt down everyone related to Saul, kill them all, and then establish himself as king. But he does the opposite. He becomes king and he says, hey, is there anyone in Saul's family that I can show kindness to? I mean, he's just going out of his way to show kindness. And this is, once again, the attitude of someone who recognizes that they have been blessed by God. And, and once again, the needs are around us of the people that we could show kindness to if we are available and ready and present in the moment to, to show it. Now, this is not a while ago. My wife was picking up some groceries at Publix. And uh, my wife gets in the express. It's only a few things. She gets in the express lane, and the lady in front of her is checking out. Uh, she's got a few things. The cashier tells the woman how much she owes, and uh, the woman looks in her purse and realizes that she's forgotten her wallet. She, the woman then starts to cry. And says, I can't believe this. This is the kind of day I'm having. Why does nothing ever work out? I, you know, and, and she just starts uh, really, she's upset. She's crying. And uh, so 
Um, my wife, upon hearing all of this, you know, says, listen, it's okay. I'd be more than happy to pay for your groceries. And then she turns and she says, really, you would do that? And, and my wife, Carrie, says, listen, yeah, I, I believe that God put me here in this lane so that I could buy your groceries and so that you could know how much God loves you. Well, the woman was crying before. Now she's hysterical. Oh, I can't believe, you know, I mean, just really going for it, right? And then, of course, it doesn't take much, but then my wife starts to cry. And the, mo- the, the situation is so moving, the cashier starts to cry. So it is a mess on the express lane at Publix on Miramar Parkway. And so, uh, and, and then, I, 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 so I, part of me always wishes I was there for that. Like, how did that whole transaction end? You know, like my wife swipes the card, and then, you know, you save four dollars. Thank you for shopping. You know, I'm not sure how that all ended, right? But the point is this. I just would have moved to another lane. But see, that's the difference between my wife and I. Um, and, lo- and I always tell her, I'm like, I'm so glad you were in the checkout lane because it limited the number of items. And uh, so that's just the, that's like the administrator part of me. And, uh, but no, you did the right thing. I would have done it too, you know. Yeah. Just don't do it too often or our kids aren't going to college. Uh, so, <laughs> but here's the point, right? The needs are around us. We've just got to be aware of our surroundings and, and, and take the time to slow down. And once again, here's the thing is that um, if you're not aware of the story, um, this guy, Mephibosheth, which I would, you know, try saying that 10 times fast later. Um, who's, who names? Anyway. Uh, so Mephibosheth was lame in both of his feet. And the reason was because, once again, 2 Samuel chapter 4 tells us why. And that is because when his, I told you the story that David and, or I'm sorry, that, that Saul and Jonathan die on this hill, um, on Mount Gilboa. And so the news comes back to the royal family that Saul has died uh, at the hand of the Philistines. And so what happens is, is that then uh, Mephibosheth is five years old. The, the woman who is his nurse grabs him to go to a safe place for them because this area of Jerusalem is not safe anymore. So as she's grabbing him, she drops him. Um, as she drops him, she breaks, uh, his, both of his legs break. And because in the mess of all of this, because his legs weren't set properly for them to heal, uh, they, they didn't heal properly, and once again, he wasn't able to walk. And so now, once again, this guy is, you know, I mean, and this guy is the grandson of Saul that maybe could have made some kind of claim. But he do, David does what, what Paul tells us to do as believers. And he says that let each of you not look out for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And the reality is this, right? When we talk about that I need to be aware of the needs. Guys, can, you know, I recognize that for us, um, typically um, women are more observant than men, typically speaking. Um, I know there might be, you know, well, it's not it's the opposite with us. I realize that. You're just, you know, you're, you're an outlier uh, as far as the, um, you know, as, as far as the rule goes. Uh, you're the exception to the rule. But, like, for me, I am not the most observant person in the world. You know, my wife, something will happen. She's like, hey, did you hear, see so-and-so? They, they did this or whatever. And I'm like, I didn't realize so-and-so was there, much less whatever they changed. You know, and... Uh, but sometimes my wife, like, changes her hair. Guys, you ever have this happen? Like, your wife changes her hair? Um, and, and my wife's like, Bob, I, I, did, I did this to my hair, and you didn't say anything, you know. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm sorry. But you have to understand, hair is not my forte. <laughs> and uh, my son reminds me of that. My son has amazing hair, amazing hair. Uh, everywhere we go, people are talking about how much they love my son's hair, and then they look at me like, is he adopted? Uh, and I'm like, no. He just, his mom has amazing hair. And, uh, but every time I cut my son's hair, and I just usually like trim the sides and the back, and then he's got the mop on top. And uh, he'll, every time, it's like, Dad, please, I don't want to end up like you. You know, like, this is just a bad haircut. That like, you know, anyway. So, um, but hey, I got a $50 off thing for a hair club for men. So who knows what I'll look like in a couple of weeks. Um, but, but here's the thing is that I'm trying to notice now, right? So the other day, my, um, I, I come home and I say, you did something with your hair. It looks different. It looks different. 
And uh, I'm like, I'm right, aren't I? And my wife says, yes. I did something different two weeks ago. And I'm like, boom, I'm right. Let's bring it up top. No? Okay. And, and, uh, and then she says, uh, and she just left me hanging up top. And she says, you don't, you don't get a high five for two weeks late. So I don't know where the cutoff is, but she's like, no, no, there's no, I'm not meeting you up top. So anyway, um, but the, once again, the, point, the, the, the thing that's amazing to me is that it's not that David has to do this. It's that David wants to. And once again, there's a specific reason. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm hinting to that. We're going to get to it in a moment. Um, and then he calls for the son of Jonathan to come to him. And look at what happens. Look at verse 6. He says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he fell on his feet, or fell on his face and prostrated himself. So he's laying flat on the ground, face to the ground. And then uh, he said, Mephibosheth, and he said, Here is your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear. Why? Because Mephibosheth thinks, you know, it's going to be over because that's what kings do. Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness. For Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And if you pause there and give me your attention, here's the second thing that I want you to notice. And that is kindness is not just about being aware of the needs and seeking to meet them. Um, It's about also, it's it's about, uh, I need to know how to respond. I need to know how to respond. You know, one of the things that you'll learn as you study the Bible is that um, you study what's said, but then you'll also realize the things that aren't said. And sometimes the things that aren't said speak volumes to us as well. David, uh, Mephibosheth says, why do you care about me, a dead dog? And you know what David does? He doesn't even entertain the question. Uh, he, he doesn't say, no, well, you're not a dead dog. No, he, he just says, Here's what we're going to do for you because you are the son of a king. And we're going to treat you as such. And what he's trying to do is give David a different picture. I'm sorry, give Mephibosheth a different picture, a different perspective of what his future could look like. And once again, David is changing this guy's thinking by by speaking a new vision into his life. And that's what, what I love that he does. In Proverbs 10, it says that the lips of the godly speak helpful words. The lips of the godly speak helpful words. Listen, when we're sloppy with our words, that's why sometimes it causes more problems than it helps. Sometimes the best thing that you can say is nothing, right? Um, Because sometimes just your presence is speaking the loudest, right, more than anything else. Um, You know, I have, over in the last 20 years as a pastor, I've officiated, goodness, hundreds of, of funerals and memorial services. And I have found that people tend to say the dumbest things at funerals and memorial services. Why? Because they don't know what to say. But they feel the burning desire to say something. And so when not knowing what to say, any idiotic thing will do. You know, and, and it's like, and I just wonder like, like, did you have to? Really? Like, do you know people like that? Like, they just have to say something. They have to add their own commentary. Of it. Like, that drives me crazy. I have family members like that. I just change my number and don't tell them. You know what I mean? Like, they just drive, they drive me nuts because they just, they, they feel compelled by the universe to say something. Like, you know, you could just listen. Yeah, but you know, there's, it just, this happened because like, no, please, you know, and this is what happens like, and you go to, uh, now I'm going to get, let me just sidebar for a minute, right? I'm going to give you a little life lesson here. Some of you already know this. Some of you, this is going to be brand new information. Okay. So you may want to write it down. When, when someone loses a loved one and you go to the funeral, here's what you say. I'm sorry for your loss. All right. You want to freestyle a little bit? Here's what you say. I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, or you, if you want to say, I'm very sorry for your loss, my friend. All right? You want that, so these are the only other options, if, unless if you're not sure what to say. All right? What, what drives me, you know, you tell them that you love them, that you're going to be praying for them. Here's what you don't say. Don't cry. For me, Argentina. Uh, don't cry. All right? They're in heaven. You sh- we should be happy for them. Like, 
where was Floyd Mayweather then? You know, that's what, you know what I mean? That's what we need. Like, come on. But people say that. We should be happy for them. Like, okay. We recognize that heaven is real. We recognize this person who is in pain isn't in pain. But a lot of times we're crying not for them. We're crying for us. Because there is a separation. Because the, 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 the sadness of loss is real. And so once again, th- there's, there's this moment where sometimes we can just say, like, we recognize the person's gone. We realize, oh, they're in a better place. We recognize that. But, but the pain of loss is a real thing. So we say, I'm sorry for your loss. Once again, unless you've got something really good that has been tested and proven to work. But if you're like, I just kind of thought this thing up, you know, I wrote a poem. No. Sorry for your loss. Or I'm very sorry for your loss, my friend. That's it. All right? So because you just, get, once again, this idea, you, we've just got to be wise with the words that we use. I mean, I, I learned this. My, my stepbrother, who's three years older than me, um, he taught me this. And, uh, and I, 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 it, I mean, okay, so I had this friend named Mike when I was a kid. I was about 12, and we had been friends for years, um, well, about four or five years at the time. And uh, he was my next-door neighbor. And he started dating this girl. And the girl was, how do we describe this? Well, uh, let, well, let's just say on Halloween she didn't have to wear a costume, okay? Because she was that scary looking. And um, so a few months, that, and, but, you know, he started dating her because she had a car. And so that's kind of how that worked. So anyway, so that's, that's that. So they broke up after a couple of months, and my friend Mike asked me what I thought. I'm like, dude, don't worry about it. She was ugly anyway. And my stepbrother steps in, and he's like, no. And I'm like, it's okay. They broke up. You can say whatever you want now. And he said to me, he said, Bob, listen to me. People break up, and sometimes they get back together. And you just, you can't, you got to be careful what you say. You can't say that. Well, anyway, two weeks later, Mike and the scary girl got back together. <laughs> and I saw her drive up, and I saw them drive off. And Mike and I barely spoke ever again until I moved. And why? Because you just got to be careful with the words that you use. That's why the Bible says this, when words are many... Sin is not absent. That's why, I'm always, that's why I get myself in trouble because I, I speak for a living, right? I'm talking all the time, I'm talking to you guys, talking to all kinds of other people. And I, I sometimes, every once in a while, I, I say once in a while to be very gracious to myself, um, I, I get myself into trouble. Why? Because when words are many, sin is not absent, all right? So if you talk a lot, just know you're going to bump up against that verse more times than you like. And that's why it says, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Um, And so, but once again, here's what I encourage you to do. If you will use the words that you have, the opportunities that you have, to give people a new vision for themselves and for their lives, you will never lack friends. You will never lack opportunities in life. Uh, When you encourage people with the words that that you use, I'm telling you, you'll never lack opportunities. Because when somebody says, well, who are we going to fill that Position is open. Who are we going to fill it with? Who are we promoting? Well, there's the guy that's hostile. There's the guy that's sarcastic. But then there's this other guy that's always like lifting people up. Hmm, who do we pick? I mean, is there even a choice here, right? I mean, it's always the person that, you know, gets the, the opportunity. He gets the, the, hey, the, the business venture, whatever it is, the event to be invited to. Why? Because we live in this world that is so depleted of encouragement, so depleted of words of life, that when you use words to bless people, you will never lack an audience. So look at what happens. He says, are you gonna, what are you going to do with a dead dog like me? David doesn't even answer that. He gives Mephibosheth a brand new vision of what his life could be. And look at verse 9. It says this. It says, and the king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, he says, I have given, uh, I've, I've given your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to his house. You, therefore, your sons, your servants, shall work the land for him, and you shall bring him. Uh, you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has, has commanded his servant, so your servant 
will do. And as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. And so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. Now if you pause there and give me your attention, here's the last thing I want to share with you. And that is that uh, kindness, uh, if we want to be kind, that is I need to be generous with others. You see, David does the unthinkable. And that is that he gives Mephibosheth all the land that belonged to Saul. Being a king, that would have been quite a bit. And David becoming king, that, that naturally would have come under, uh, his, become his property. But he looks at all this and he says to Mephibosheth, hey, all that was your grandfather's, I'm giving to you. And by the way, this servant, Ziba, he's got 15 kids and 20 servants, and they all work for you. You've got 36 employees now that are working the land for you, and, they're gonna, and, they're, and once you pay everybody, you're going to keep all the profits for yourself. And so he knows that because of Mephibosheth's physical challenges, he can't work the land for himself. So he's like, hey, you've got a whole staff now that are going to do that for you. But you are going to sit at the table and eat like the, like the son of a king. And you're never going to have to worry about anything again. And see, this act of generosity, it's like, why is, he, why is David, and this is the thing, I, you know, you, you read this over and over, and you're like, why is David going out of his way to, be, to find someone to be kind to? That's part of this family. You see, it was this act of generosity that showed that David had really forgiven Saul. You see, if you aren't aware of the story, um, Saul was king. But after God had rejected Saul as king, he sent the prophet Samuel to anoint David to be king. And so there was a time when there was the one who had been appointed king or anointed king, and then there was the guy who was still on the throne whom God had rejected. And there was a season of waiting David waiting for his turn. And so David becomes king, and he doesn't have to be kind to Saul's family. He could have killed him, but he decides not to kill them. But he also could have just, you know, not gone out of his way to help them. But, you know, he could have held the grudge and wiped them out, but he doesn't do that. But instead he says, I want to find someone in Saul's house that I can show kindness to. Why is that? Because kindness is the last step in the forgiveness process. When we generously do for someone, pray for someone, or help the one that hurt us, it shows that we really have forgiven that person. You see, there's this, the, the, this forgiveness really is a process. When someone sins against you and hurts you, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you recognize like, I, I'm not allowed to hold a grudge. I've got to release it. I've got to forgive it. But let's be honest. There have been people that we have forgiven, but we've never wanted to see again. Uh, and there, but there comes a point in time in the forgiveness process where it's not just, yeah, I forgive them, but I don't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, or there's the pro, there comes the process where you just, yeah, I forgive them, and you know, I pray that God does a great work in them. You see, this can happen. Um, you know, this, maybe there's a, there's a couple that gets divorced. And maybe the one that felt more wronged musters up the courage to forgive. But then there's another part that happens. And that is, you say, well, I, I forgive this person, but I certainly never want to see them again. And then maybe you do see them again, and you say, well, um, I forgive them, and, and we would never admit this. So, you know, I'll admit on behalf of everybody, you know. It's like, we'll, we'll say, well, I forgive them, but I hope they never find love again. Because I want them to wake up someday in the middle of the night and realize what they missed out when they let me go. And, and when, when they just nuked our relationship, our family, whatever it was, and I hope they never find love again. And, and there's, so, I mean, I forgive them for what they did for me, but I'm just not saying I want actually anything good to happen to them later on in life. Um, so I'm betting against them. And so, but what happens is this, is that there comes a season of time when you do forgive them. But then when the full work of forgiveness sets in, you start praying for God to bless them. And you do pray for 
the kindness of God to do a work in them and through them. And so you start praying good things in their life. And that's why um, this isn't something that we just kind of muster up ourselves. At the beginning of this chapter, you know what David says? In verse 3, he says, Is there still not anyone left in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? It's not just our kindness. It's, 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 it's something supernatural. And that there really is something that takes place in this forgiveness process. When I get to the end, that it's like, I'm not, I, it's not just that I forgive you for what you did and I just never want to see you or I just hope that nothing good happens to you. But I really do pray kindness in your life. And, and I really would help if, I, if, if the opportunity arises. And that's when you know that you've really been set free. You see, the thing that we learn from David and Mephibosheth is that David never let Saul's hatred of David um, be reciprocated. He never let that hatred that, the, the, that Saul and maybe some of his family had towards David actually affect, carry over into other relationships. Instead, David's kindness of Mephibosheth shows us that he wasn't carrying a grudge and that he really had forgiven you see, we can show the kindness of God because the kindness of God has been shown to us. Because the Bible tells us this in Romans chapter 2, that it's the kindness of God, the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, that leads us to change. It's not beating us over the head. It's, it, it's not by force. Instead, it's God showing his kindness in our lives that has actually caused us to change. And maybe it's when someone who's realized that God has shown kindness to us when we forgive that we realize that now we can show kindness to someone else because if we're looking for an example of God's kindness we don't have to look any further than our own mirror because we are the examples of God's kindness of God's grace that's what the Bible says in in Ephesians 2 it's the last verse in your outline it says he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus and so he can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us you see we forgive because we've been forgiven we can love because we've been loved we can show mercy because God's been merciful to us And we can show kindness because we have been the recipients of the kindness of God. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being kind to us. May we be a reflection of your kindness, of your love, of your grace, a right representation of who you are. And if we haven't received this kindness, may today be the day when we invite you to come into our lives and transform us from the inside out. We pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen, amen. We hope you enjoyed the message. If today you want to take your next step with God and give your life to Jesus, we have a free gift for you. All you got to do is go to mycalvary.com forward slash begin. I also want to encourage you, share this message with your friends and your family and also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. From all of us at Calvary, God bless you.